Welcome everybody to the third and final talk of today's uh, series of talks for the German Irish Vampire Festival. Uh, you're very, very welcome to, um, to the talk and I hope you've been enjoying the talks today so far and of course the whole festival. We have a lot programmed, um, including films and an exhibition that is running in Silent Green in Transmedia L Studio. And then on Tuesday, we will have the uh, closing concert, an electronic music score that we have specially commissioned uh, for Nosferatu. Um, we're joined now by Madeline Potter. Um, so Madeline is joining us from Manchester. She is a postdoctoral research fellow at Edge Hill University. Um, her work explores the theological underpinnings of monstrous depictions in 19th century Irish Gothic literature um, and her academic monograph, Theological Monsters, Religion and Irish Gothic is forthcoming with the University of Wales Press. So I will hand over now to Madeline. And as I mentioned, if you have any questions or comments, you can put them in the chat box and we will uh, do uh, go to Q&A after the talk. So over to you, Madeline. Thank you so much. And while I do the boring stuff of sharing my screen, um, I just want to take the opportunity to thank Candice so much for this uh, invitation and for putting together what seems like an absolutely wonderful um, festival on Irish and German vampires. Um, so yes, uh, welcome to my talk, The Banshee and the Death Coach, Irish Folklore and Dark Romanticism in Joseph Sheridan the Funnies, Carmilla. So what I want to do in this talk is situate uh, Carmilla and Joseph Sheridan the Funnies work into the history of, of Irish Gothic literature, which is very much informed by Irish history. And then I want to explore in the second section of my paper how some of uh, Ireland's particular folk myths and fairy lore come into the novella Carmilla and then move on to a broader situation of uh, Carmilla in the context of German, of the German tradition of dark romanticism. Now, I think we're all familiar with Carmilla in various shapes and forms, whether that's from Castlevania or from the um, web series, uh, which is a particular popular one uh, amongst um, queer Gothic fans, or from the recent adaptation of, of the film, or perhaps from the original novel, uh, novella, sorry. But what I think many readers and fans of Carmilla tend to overlook is how deeply informed Carmilla is by um, Irish history and Irish folklore. It's a very complex novella, a short read such as uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula, but it's at the same time a very complex novella which weaves in all these various elements of, of history, of folk and fairy lore, and uh, draws on um, a really interesting literary tradition. So uh, just to give you a bit of background about who Joseph Sheridan the Funny was. So he was born in 1814 and died in 1873. Now, many of you may know that Carmilla was initially serialized in 1872 in the magazine, The Dark Blue, and then included in the collection In a Glass Darkly in 73. So that shows us that Carmilla is a very late work of Le Fanu's when all of his literary and, and religious and folkloric imagination imagination would have reached its maturity. Um, now, Le Fanu was uh, the, the son of Thomas Philip Le Fanu, who was a Church of Ireland clergyman. Uh, so Le Fanu was part of uh, a family of Huguenot descent. He was integrated into the Anglo-Irish um, ascendancy. Um, and it's this hybrid identity that is really interesting for Lefani himself. Um, now, initially they were born, he was born in Dublin. Uh, he moved at a young age uh, in, in a region called Phoenix Park. 
uh, on the outskirts of Dublin. And then when he was about 10, his father was appointed uh, Dean of Abington in County Limerick. So the whole family moved there. And it was roughly around the time when the tithe wars were happening. So just for those of you who aren't familiar with this uh, background, a tithe, which comes from the word tenth, uh, was a payment uh, set up as an obligation for people who worked land um, to, to pay uh, a certain portion of, of their income to the uh, established church, which was the Church of Ireland. And this caused a lot of tension in Ireland, which had a vast Catholic majority, especially in rural Ireland. Um, it increased, obviously, the financial burden on particularly farmers, and it was just, um, as um, Bill McCormack says, an irritant in Irish affairs from roughly the 18th century onwards. But it was really during the 1820s and 1830s, so when Lafani was in Limerick, that this became a much weightier issue. Um, Limerick, County Limerick, so the, the region where young Joseph Sheridan Lafani lived with his family, uh, was particularly affected by this. And now it's important to point out that the tithe wars weren't actual wars with kind of army clashing, uh, but they were a series of, of violent uprisings and violent clashes. And, and Limerick, County Limerick, was particularly affected by this um, when... Um, a Church of Ireland clergyman called Reverend Coote uh, heard about some not very nice um, words that a Catholic counterpart of his called Father Hickey had to say about him. And so this caused a bit of tension and then Hickey refused to pay the tithe to Coote. He ended up uh, impounding one of his cows and then this led to a violent uprising. Um, in this region, it caused Coote to, as uh, William McCormack says, become a marked man, and some of the resentment he inspired rubbed off on the Lafanis. Um, none of the family went out alone, and they were all, at all times armed. When Catherine, who is uh, Joseph Sheridan's sister, um, with some girl cousins, visitors to the glebe ventured out unprotected. They were pelted with mud and stones and any excursion by the family was greeted with shouts and cursing. Um, McCormack also uh, includes in his uh, book on Joseph Sheridan Lafani on Victorian Ireland an account from John Wickham, who, who said that uh, Dean Lafani's residence was often attacked. Uh, a set of ruffians are in the daily habit in the passage to and from a bog in the neighbourhood of Dean Lafani's uh, residence of using the most horrid threats and imprecations against the gentleman and his family. So this violence uh, really impacted young Joseph Sheridan Lafani's uh, imagination in, in his late childhood. In addition to this, there was already a forming genre which is called Irish Gothic. And often when we think about the Gothic, we think about it starting off with writers such as Anne Ratcliffe or Horace Walpole or Matthew Lewis. And there is a tendency to think about the Gothic in a very English setting and this kind of really haunted space of, of ruins and deserted castles. Um, but there is this really strong tradition of, of Irish Gothic, which diverges from the English tradition and is really its own really interesting thing. And there are two uh, different um, dimensions to the formation of Irish Gothic. The first is that uh, Irish literature in general, not just in the Gothic genre, but uh, particularly in the Gothic genre, engages with a Celtic substratum, which has very much fueled um, the Gothic imagination. It's led to films such as uh, the horror film Leprechaun, which you might have seen, uh, various iterations of the Banshee, but also uh, the creepy and airy yet lovely Song of the Sea, which I would definitely recommend, which draws on the... Um, um, legend of the Selkie. 
So Jarlath Killeen argued that basically Ireland is mapped out as a zone of weirdness where all these uh, myths refuse to, to die. They all kind of always emerge to the surface. Um, in addition to this, I don't know why my slides are stuck. Yeah, there you go. Um, there was a lot of political and religious tension in, in Ireland. Um, now, after the Reformation in England, it was fairly easy to gain control, um, but in Ireland, the, these tensions remained, and uh, the Catholic majority continued to resent uh, the, new, the newly formed Protestant ruling class, which was called uh, the Protestant Ascendancy, and who were basically the English settlers, uh, so there's a very kind of colonial presence there. They were landowners and members of the established church, which was, again, the Church of Ireland, uh, Protestant church. Uh, the status of the Protestant ascendancy became embedded around 1691 with a series of quite violent penal laws, um, such as, for example, the Banishment Act, which... Um, held that all Catholic clergy had to be deported from Ireland or risk being accused of high treason if they were to come back. Um, so there was a there was a series of a very repressive acts that, that really tried to, to strengthen the, the grip of the Protestant ascendancy um, in, in Ireland. Now, later on, uh, the descendants of the Protestant ascendancy came to be known as the Anglo-Irish. Now, what's interesting is that um, most of the penal laws actually became repealed during the late 18th and early 19th century. The last one was repealed in 1829, which is roughly when uh, Irish Gothic was really, really starting to flourish. Um, and this is this has created a lot of gothic anxiety and a sense of gothic fear to some of the members of the protestant ascendancy so for example uh one of the main writers in the irish gothic tradition often hailed as part of the unholy trinity of, of irish gothic alongside uh the funny and brown stoker is charles robert maturin who wrote a novel called uh, melmut the wanderer which i would recommend to you um, and in one of his sermons, because he was also um, a clergyman, he used this very gothic inflected language to refer to the threat of Catholicism coming back in Ireland. So he said, fierce zealots and factitious demagogues may give a kind of posthumous and galvanic existence to the course of superstition, but to raise it to life again is beyond their power. Um, just, just to note, course is an ancient word for corpse, basically. And Patrick O'Malley, in his book on um, Catholicism, sexual deviancy um, um, in Victorian Gothic culture, notices very interestingly how Maturin taps into this language of, of the revenant. He, he likens it to... Um, Frankenstein's monster coming back to life, especially in its reference to galvanism. So all these things exist and create this tension in Ireland and make it a space where the Gothic imagination and hence Gothic literature can flourish. Um, now, in terms of Joseph Sheridan Fanny's own literary career, he was, as various critics, including Guy Girard, uh, have noticed very, very um, deeply influenced by his time at the Dublin University magazine. So Gerard has argued that Lefani's superb craft at creating uncanny atmospheres and dark anxieties is thus to be traced back to his early collaboration with the Dublin University magazine, um, quote, end quote. Uh, in the period between 1838 and 1869, uh, Lefani contributed some 25 short stories uh, to the Dublin University magazine. And then between 61 and 69, he started serializing his novels. Lefani was a prolific writer. He spent a lot of his uh, life in debt. There was a lot of financial pressure on him. So he just had to write. He just had to churn his, his fiction out. Um, and so he, he, he used it as an opportunity to serialize his novels. He was also the owner and editor of, of 
the Dublin University magazine, which, as Gerard has further argued, provided him with a unique opportunity to build his distinctive voice. And this is where many critics draw attention to, to this early influence and how his voice is different from Bram Stoker's. And indeed, Bram Stoker draws a lot of inspiration from Le Fanny. Um, and, and many critics have deplored the fact that really Le Fanny, potentially being the better writer out of the two, um, has remained somewhat in the shadow of a Bram Stoker and the success of Dracula. Um, many of Le Fanny's early stories uh, was set in Ireland, and he was very much engaging with that locality of, of County Limerick, especially, for example, in stories of Love Gur, which is a local lake in, in County Limerick, and where during his late childhood, he heard all, all these myths and, and tales of fairies and, and just folklore and hauntings, and that really made an impact on, on his imagination. Later on in his in the middle part of his career, when he was working with Bennett, um, he was told that he had to stop writing about Ireland because the English public were fishing in his work and that he had to address his stories to um, an, a modern audience in an English context. But even during that middle period, you can still see these various um, Irish voices and ghosts that haunt his, his fiction, such as in the novel Uncle Silas, which is set in Derbyshire because of that um, particular demand that his, his editor had made on him. But then in his later part of his career, and if you remember, I mentioned that Carmilla is, is one of his very late works, he starts going back to Irish settings increasingly, not in Carmilla itself, but I'll get to that in a minute. Now, the Dublin University magazine was also um, really linked to, to the formation of a particular strand of Irish culture, and that's Anglo-Irish culture. So Bill McCormack, in his book on the Fanu and Victorian Ireland, uh, talks about the Dublin University magazine in terms of attempts to identify and, and define a an distinctively Anglo-Irish literature. Um, which would have also meant moving away from the Gaelic speaking literature of Ireland, but nonetheless going back to a very distinctively Irish legendary past and position and trying to, to find ways in which they could say that, um, I quote uh, from McCormack, the Protestant minority could uh, shared into Irish culture. So there was this reclaiming of Irishness uh, on the part of the Protestant ascendancy. Um, this is also linked to that fear and, and threat of, of the Catholic emancipation, and especially in the aftermath of the Acts of Union, when the Anglo-Irish started feeling quite uh, dispossessed and feeling a sense of, of loss of identity, which is something that Roy Foster in, in his Protestant magic in, in Paddy and Mr. Punch also recognizes um, as he describes Irish Gothic writers as a group whose occult preoccupations mirror a sense of displacement, a loss of social and psychological integration, and an escapism by the threat of a takeover by the middle, uh, by the Catholic middle classes. So, there is in Carmilla the sense of negotiating a hybrid identity, and I want to draw attention to the fact that Anglo-Irish identity is not Anglo and Irish or Irish and English, but it's rather a hyphenated joint identity, which is very much linked to the ambivalence that is brought into the Gothic as a genre itself. Now, it's been very interesting because sometimes when critics look at colonialism and displacement in Carmilla, they tend to focus on, on this kind of binary between colonial and colonized powers and draw attention to how um, in Styria, Laura's family creates what's been variously described as a bastion of Englishness. 
Uh, we've got Laura describing it very early on in chapter two, for example, saying it is not too stately to be extremely comfortable. And here we had our tea for for with his usual patriotic leanings, he insisted that the national beverage should make its appearance regularly with our coffee and chocolate. She's talking about her father, who's um, an Englishman. And there's this interesting contrast between the Central European uh, culture of, of coffee and chocolate and the national beverage of England. Um, and also her reference to them uh, quoting Shakespeare, um, by way of keeping their English, as you can see on the second quotation on this slide. Patrick O'Malley has described this as a refuge of Englishness in the midst of diarrhea. But he also talks about how the revelation that um, Laura might be potentially descended from Carmilla, that it is, I quote from him, half Karnstein blood that Carmilla drains from Laura, end quote, really destabilizes the uh, boundaries between foreign and domestic. And that really, when we think about it, it's Laura who's a colonial presence in, in Styria, which is Carmilla's home. So the very boundaries of monstrosity and um, parasitism and colonialism get displaced. Now, Laura herself, interestingly, her father was um, a member of the Austrian military, which reinforces the idea of colonialism, but also her mother was an Austrian, a Styrian lady. So she is much like Le Fanu himself, a hybrid, someone whose identity draws from these two places, and she tries to to make sense of, of that hybrid hyphenated identity. And I think that sense of, of working through the idea of Irish history and Anglo-Irishness as rooted in Irish history as Le Fanny and the Dublin University Magazine were trying to construe it, very much translates into Laura's own character. Um, At the same time, it was during the 19th century that society, both in um, England and in Ireland, was going through what's been variously termed by a uh, folklorist, a fairy tale revival. So in Ireland, particularly, we get uh, Thomas Crofton Croker and the publish, uh, publishing his fairy legends and tradition of the south of Ireland. Uh, many of which were focused on the region around County Limerick, specifically Lothgar. So again, this is something that Lafani was really fascinated with. Lafani read Thomas Crofton Croker's work and was really immersed in his fairy law. At the same time, we get just this broader sense of, of engagement with uh, fairy tales. We get this genre of Victorian fairy painting. We can see on your slide um, Atkin, John Atkinson Grimshaw's painting, but there are many other examples if you were to, to look up Victorian fairy painting. Um, and also translations of German fairy tales, specifically the Grimm uh, Brothers fairy tales. Uh, circulating widely around um, towards fairy law and fake law. And this really influences uh, Le Fanu's own work. Now, I just want to mention briefly that if we try to read Le Fanu's work as this is just fake law, or this is just religion, or this is just occultism, it it gets a bit difficult. He, he, he uses a polyphony of voices and a polyphony of myths, a web of myths which have worked together. From his very early tales, which he published in the Dublin University magazine, he's engaging with topics such as changelings and fairy doctors, which he takes from Thomas Crofton Croker and the stories he heard uh, as, as a child in County Limerick. But he's also very much experimenting with the voice of the other. So uh, he writes stories from that he frames from the point of view of a Catholic priest called uh, Father Purcell, but he also very much as you might know from Carmilla, for those of you who've read it, writes from a female point of view. Um, he also does this in his 
best known novel, Uncle Silas, which is narrated from the point of view of Maud. And he weaves all these uh, various strands of, of interest and of explorations of, of mythology of, of, and of the other in what his interest in occultism, specifically the writings of Emanuel Swedenborg, who was a Swedish theologian who thought he could converse with angels and demons and just move free, freely from um, between heaven and hell. So then, considering this kind of polyphony, uh, it's unsurprising that many and various influences come into Carmilla. And these range from um, the tradition of vampire fictions in literature in English that is already starting to, to the, the first prose fiction uh, that deals with vampires is most likely John Polidori's 1818 text, The Vampire. And then we have a series of, of lesser known vampire stories. Then we've got um, the, the monstrosity that is Varney the Vampire, which was serialized over about four or five years uh, every week. Um, so all these traditions of writing literary vampires are already starting to take root in, in the literary landscape of, of Britain and Ireland. But he's also engaging with European vampire folklore and the way it's reached uh, an English speaking context and the way it's circulating in an English uh, speaking context. And beyond these, there is this really strong underlying but absolutely foundational substratum of Irish myth and folklore running, as I mentioned, all the way through his work from his very early short stories through to his big novels and into his later work uh, in Adele Starkly and the novella Carmilla. So now I'm just going to try and unpack some of those for you. Um, and I'll mention the uh, myth of the coach de Boer, uh, the silent coach, um, which it's not exclusive to Ireland. It's found variously across Western Europe, but it's particularly strong in, in Ireland, which is the silent death coach, which comes to basically physically claim people and take them across the threshold of life and death. So physically carry them into death. So if you see this coach, someone's going to die, it might be you because that you might be taken into the coach or it might be that it's going to uh, fetch somebody else. But if you see this coach, it's a death that's going to happen. Uh, the, the myth of the Koshtabar appears in slightly different forms across Ireland. Uh, Tony Locke um, talks about it in his May of Folk Tales, while the National Folklore Collection at University Co uh, College Dublin uh, talks about it being really popular in County Clare, where it was mentioned among the people of this locality. So it's not a kind of monolithic myth, but basically the the gist of it is that it's going to claim somebody. It's usually, it usually doesn't make any sound at all, but sometimes it's actually announced by the screech of the banshee. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but for now, I want to point out that Lefanu's engagement with the death coach and the myth of the coach of war is absolutely fundamental. And this is not something that just, if you think about Carmilla, obviously Carmilla arrives at Laura Schloss in, uh, in a coach. But this is something that Lefanu has been thinking about for a while. Now, Lefanu is a writer who is known uh, for his obsessive rewriting and reworkings of his previous stories. Um, so he writes a short story and then he rewrites it, he turns it up again. So for example, um, The Familiar in Green Tea is actually a reworking of an earlier short story that he published um, ages before. And critics have often commented on how Carmilla doesn't seem to be a rewriting of anything that came before. 
But actually, if you look at his fairy tales, it very much is. It doesn't feature a vampire. So none of his writing features a vampire before, but these are the same themes that he's engaging with. Um, so a very short story, which you could read in half an hour. So I would definitely recommend it, which was published in 1870, three years before Carmilla, is the call, is called The Child That Went With the Fairies, in which uh, little boy Billy basically ends up stepping into a death coach and being um, ferried away by fairies into fairyland, which often in uh, Irish folklore tends to get conflated with the idea of the afterworld. Uh, and Reverend O'Hanlon, for example, has written about how in the uh, peasant Irish imagination, uh, fairyland was the place where children who were abducted were taken into. So it's a kind of sublimation of, of trauma, of the trauma of, of child loss, really. Uh, so in the child that went with the fairies, um, we see uh, this really impressive and magnificent coach arrive, uh, harnesses and trappings with scarlet blazing with gold, horses were huge, snow white with great manes, they tossed and shook them in the air, seemed to stream and float, sometimes longer and sometimes shorter, like so much smoke, their tails were long and tied up in boughs of bought scarlet and gold ribbon, the coach itself was glowing with colours, gilded and emblazoned, and then there are um, two women in this coach and one of them is really beautiful and one of them is actually really scary looking and frightening. Significantly, uh, the voice of the beautiful woman basically coaxes little Billy into stepping into that coach and her voice is compared to a silver bell. And there is this Irish uh, folk tradition of the silver bell being um, a symbol that's given to couples when they wed. And it said that if you've got, uh, if the couples inevitably at some point end up fighting, that they should uh, sound ring the silver bell and all will be well. So there's this idea of, of a permanent union uh, wrought into the idea of the silver bell. And unsurprisingly, the second fairy story that came right before Carmilla is Laura Silver Bell, which once again, like Carmilla, features a story of supernatural seduction. Uh, it's not a uh, lesbian story, it's a heterosexual story in this case. But uh, this really sinister fairy lord who wears black velvet and is really seductive to Laura. So notice the similarity in the name as well. Um, is very much a kind of Carmilla figure, a figure who tries to, through whom uh, Le Fanny tries to imagine the afterlife materially in various ways. And there's um, kind of midwife and witch fairy doctor figure there called Mother Clark, um, who is summoned by this really sinister fairy lord to come over to fairyland and help Laura deliver her baby that she's conceived with this fairy creature and he he does so in the same kind of death coach and the same kind of coish to bar uh, type of, of carriage and he comes and fetches uh, Mother Clark and takes her across into fairyland. Um, I won't spoil it so it's very short um, so you can read it and this is exactly so when People think that Kamala is really a rewriting of, um, any of his earlier um, stories. I think it's very much a rewriting of Child One with the Fair of the Quash of War. Let's look at Laura. I hope you can hear me all right because it says my connection is unstable. Um, uh, Madeline, just um, it, once in a while, it does sort of jitter out uh, on some words. It might help if you turn your video off and keep the screen share. I will do. Let's try that. I will do. So hopefully this is, um, hopefully this will help. Thanks, Madeline. Sorry to interrupt. No worries. No, I just noticed that it was saying so. Um, hopefully it's fine now. But basically when Camilla arrives at the Schloss, um, this is recounted through Laura's eyes. 
He says, curiosity opened my eyes and I saw a scene of utter confusion. It was two wheels in the air. The men were busy removing the traces and a lady with a commanding air and figure had got out and stood with clasped hands, raising the handkerchief that was in them every now and then uh, to her eyes. Through the carriage door, uh, though, no, through the carriage door was now lifted a young lady who appeared to be lifeless. My dear old father was already beside the elder lady with his hat in his hand, evidently tendering his aid and the resources of his laws. So although we don't have any explicit mention of fairies or fairy land in Carmilla, if we look back to the scene I've described in specifically the child that went with the fairies, but also Laura Silver Bell, it's clear that La Fanny is using Using the same image of, um, of the carriage, of the death coach. And it, Carmilla is obviously an embodiment of, of death herself. Um, and if we think about the plot, it's very much a reaffirmation that Carmilla is there to, this time symbolically, ferry people over into uh, into fairyland, really, which is, again, uh, conflated with the idea of the afterlife. Much like in uh, The Child That Went With the Fairies, there is another really mysterious woman that we don't know much about in Carmilla's Coach. She's often described or referred to as Carmilla's mother. And criticism has remained to this day fairly baffled as to who she might be but I think there is that association um, between the fairies and the two fairies that we find in um, the child that went with the fairies and Carmilla's mother so she's clearly some type of a fey figure there um, my powerpoint is stuck again okay so there are various ways in which we can read Carmilla as a fairy. And we've got this idea, perhaps particularly because of Disney and its fairy costumes and representations of fairies as cutesy, diminutive little figures who are friendly. Um, but really, that's something that, as, as Tolkien writes on his, uh, in his essay on, on fairy tales, it's something that happens increasingly in the 20th century and in the aftermath of the Industrial Revolution. But specifically in Ireland, fairies are nothing like these cute, diminutive, friendly figures. They're actually often depicted as trickster figures who lure, abduct, or just play tricks on humans. And this is very much what Carmilla does. Carmilla is not just a classical vampire who feeds on the blood of her victims. She does that, of course, but at the same time, she's someone who plays uh, quite sinister psychological tricks on Laura. Uh, at the very beginning when they meet, um, for those of you who've read the nov novella, for those of you who haven't, I apologize for the spoiler, but Carmilla first visits Laura in a dream sequence when she's a child. And then when she arrives at the Schloss, um, Laura recognizes her and is naturally and is instinctively frightened. However, what Carmilla does is she instantly tells Laura, oh, I dreamt about you. Isn't that a coincidence? So she knows that Laura's recognized her from her dream and instantly just turns it upside down and mirrors it so that she can gain Laura's trust in what Victor Sage has described as when Carmilla seizes Laura's uh, dream, she seizes her reality as well. And there is another scene where this uh, quite silly uh, mountebank is selling charms to Laura and Carmilla to protect them against the vampire. And Carmilla quite perversely buys one of these charms to try and assuage Laura's fears. Um, although she's obviously the vampire, so she, she knows this. Um, there is also a reference to uh, Carmilla potentially as a fairy right at the beginning and right before this really kind of dreamy scene is interrupted by the death coach crashing, where one of the housemates describes the, the room as 
the moon this night is full of idyllic and magnetic influence. And see when you look behind you at the front of the Schloss, how all its windows flash and twinkle with that silvery splendor as if unseen hands had lighted up the room to receive fairy guests. Now we know that it's not fairy guests that they receive, but a vampire guest. guest. Uh, but there is this really interesting parallelism between this uh, idyllic setting of a, of a fairy tale, fairies, which Carmilla herself, as, as a fairy vampire, uncovers. Um, and there is an association between fairies and death, not only in, in Irish folklore, but particularly in Lefanu's writings. Um, when we think about Laura talking about her childhood dream, childhood dream sequence, she mentions how she was kept in um, ignorance of fairy and ghost stories. So once again, the boundaries between death and fairy law are being blurred out as fairies and ghosts are placed in perfect parallelism to each other. Both of these cases signaling something more sinister that lies beyond um, the world of appearance. Um, also, very often in Irish law, the fairies have their own logic and there are various rituals that will protect humans against their tricks. And if you want to, to look at them, I definitely recommend uh, Thomas Crofton Croker's uh, collection of fairy tales. I've included here on the slide, uh, the example of the brewery of eggshells, where a fairy plays a trick on a mom to brew a concoction of 12, um, of, of a kind of drink made out of 12 eggshells to force the fairy to reveal her own um, her nature but there are many examples of, of various types of rituals and and fairies kind of following a, a particular logic that, that come up in in Thomas Crofton Croker's collection and in oral uh, Irish fairy law and this is very much what we get in Carmilla as well as we are informed the vampire is subject in certain situations to special conditions. In the particular instance of which I have given you a relation, Mercala seems to be limited to a name which, if not her real one, should at least reproduce without the omission or ad addition of a single letter, those, as we say, anagrammatically, which compose it. So Carmilla is Mercala, and then she's Malaka, and then she's Carmilla. So she's bound by this logic of anagrammatically having to refashion her name um, every time she comes back to life in vampiric form. I mentioned the, in the title also of my paper, The Banshee, and I mentioned how um, the um, death coach is often announced by the screech of the banshee. You know, I just put the myth of the banshee. Um, uh, woman of the mound or fairy woman and she's usually associated with uh, announcing a death and with the ritual of keening uh, which is crying and mourning in a ritualistic manner really loudly at a death. Um, now Lady Speranza Wilde uh, the mother of Oscar Wilde uh, wrote in, in her collection on ancient legends, mystic charms and superstitions of Ireland with sketches of the Irish past, that sometimes the banshee assumes the form of some sweet singing virgin of the family who died young and has been given the mission by the invisible powers to become the harbinger of coming doom to her mortal kindred. Um, so this is really interesting if we think about Carmilla because usually... Um, especially in the aftermath of some films that depict the Banshee. The Banshee is, de is imagined as an old woman, as a scary woman. However, Carmilla is par excellence, this really seductive vampire. She's the probably the first female vampire femme fatale. She's the sexy vampire before there were sexy vampires. Um, but it's really interesting if you look at uh, Lady Speranza Wilde's account of how the banshee actually can sometimes take the form of some sweet singing virgin. And if we go back to the initial um, 
arrival at Carmilla at Laura and Laura's father's Schloss, Laura recounts that the excitement of the scene was made more painful by the clear, long drawn screams of a female voice from the carriage window. So once again, we've got that association between the screech of the banshee and the quota bar, the death coach. Right before the coach crashes, presumably it is Carmilla who screams. So there's this uh, an announcement uh, of the coach that's about to arrive, much like in some accounts of the myth that associates the banshee with the ferry, with the death coach. And interestingly enough, Carmilla's presence in the novella, physical presence, I mean, not the dream sequence that Laura recounts or the final paragraph where she's thinking about Carmilla in a reverie, but her physical presence is very symmetrically framed by this initial arrival with a long drawn scream and then a shriek at the end when she is staked. The body therefore in accordance with the ancient practice was raised and a sharp stake driven through the heart of the vampire who uttered a piercing shriek at the moment in all respects such as might escape from a living person in the last agony. So Carmilla's life in, in this novella is framed through this image of the banshee scream or the screech and of course this really draws our attention to the, just the overflowing death that she's um, spreading around especially as we find her floating in uh, a coffin full of blood at the end. So Carmilla is a novella where materialization and a physicalization of death is, is at the core of, of the story. But there are these symbolic references to fairy law in an Irish context that really help reinforce that uh, main drive of the novella. Now, another connection between uh, fairy law and the uh, image of Carmilla is potentially the uh, Jarag Jiwa, although this one is a bit more tenuous. Um, the Jarag Jiwa, which is actually an anglicization of um, an, an Irish phrase, which meant red sucker, basically relates to a legend found in the Waterford area of a female revenant who is now buried under strong base tree. So if you ever visit, um, you can see it. Um, but basically the story tells of a young woman who met the love of her life, but her father would not allow her to marry him and instead forced her into a really abusive marriage to, to someone else, which eventually led to her death. Um, she came back from the grave driven by this extreme thirst for revenge. She first went for her father and she drank his blood and then she went for her abusive husband and she drained him as well. Um, that was not enough for her so she continued this uh, vengeful story of a draining male victims uh, as, as a revenant, so as a vampiric figure. Now what's interesting though is that no, where I, during my research on Carmilla, I've not been able to find any written accounts of, of the Jarg Jiwa before Montague Summers' uh, mention of it in The Vampire in Europe, which contains an explicit reference to it, but which only came in 1929. So obviously this postdates Carmilla. So it's, it's more difficult and more tenuous to verify that Lefani would have been influenced by this myth, although obviously it is very much in the nature of, of, of folklore that it has an oral quality. So it is very possible that he might have encountered this legend in oral form, especially during his very close relationship with Patrick Kennedy uh, during the later years of his life. And um, it was what... Um, Bill McCormack has called um, an, a surprising, unusual friendship because Patrick Kennedy was exactly the opposite of what Lefani would have been. But he was essentially a bookseller. He was a walking encyclopedia of Irish mythology. So it is very possible that Lefani would have encountered this legend um, in 
in an oral form, but verifying it is a bit more complicated than his engagement with the death coach and the legend of the Banshee. Now, I just want to briefly talk a bit about Carmilla in the context of a German tradition. Um, now, the Dublin University magazine was not just concerned with exploring that side of, of Irish culture that, they, that the Anglo-Irish could claim as their own, but also, as Gay Gerard has noted, it, it was known for its partiality for dark romantic German literature. And when I mean romantic, I don't mean just I don't mean romantic love, but I mean it in the technical term that us literary critics use as the romanticist movement. The Dublin University magazine published translations of E.T.A. Hoffman, of Friedrich Schiller, and Patrick O'Neill has written about how um, German literature was, was very crucial to just the, the print practice of the Dublin University magazine and has talked about the reception of German literature in Ireland between 1750 and 1850, which is exactly when Le Fanu's imagination was being formed as a writer. He talked about there being a cultural transfer um, between uh, German literature and Irish literature, and that German literature was at this time in Ireland at its heyday. It was also around um, the, this, the kind of early 19th century, he says that many Irish people traveled to Germany. Um, Goethe was a cultural signpost for, for many in this time, and he was he was really influential on, on the practice of, of uh, the Dublin University magazine, and he was a centerpiece in general of uh, German literature reception in an Irish context. Now, it is known that Le Fanu himself engaged with this type of German law, um, especially with Goethe and Uncle Silas. He references um, an, a, a, just a setting which could have been the very spot in which to read a volume of German folklore and the darkening colonies uh, of silent nooks of the forest seemed already haunted with the voices and shadows of those charming elves and goblins and also the Earl King. And Uncle Silas is not a novel that deals explicitly with the supernatural, but he does uh, reference the, the myth of the Earl King um, which is the subject of one of Goethe, Goethe's ballads. So he was clearly immersed in, in this uh, tradition of, of German romanticism. Now, the vampire itself as a figure beyond Carmilla is a figure who, as, as Aoife Dempsey has, has noted, weaves in fairy lore and the Gothic. And it's very much rooted in European, particularly German imagination. If we think about Jane Eyre, when Bertha Mason is likened to a vampire, she's described as the foul German spectre, the vampire, because accounts of vampires in an English speaking context basically come via, they're mediated uh, through a German space. Central European German speaking space to, to be more accurate. Um, but of course, as I mentioned, what Lefani does, he weaves these accounts in with a sense of occultism, which is what's happening in Uncle Silas. Um, he's also drawing on the vampire craze and the Arnold Paul case. He was a Serbian hijack in roughly the 1726. He was accused of vampirism and caused this immense craze in a Serbian village and because they were under Austrian um, influence the Austrian emperor decided to send um, a surgeon to ba basically investigate and try to calm these these fears. Um, the surgeon was called Johannes Flukinger and he wrote a report which essentially seemed to confirm the existence of vampirism. So this brings vampirism 
from Eastern and Central Europe into Western Europe, into initially the German speaking world, and then into the English speaking world, because these reports started reaching um, the English speaking space roughly in the 18th century. The thing about uh, Johannes Buchinger is that his report talks about vampires who are closer, perhaps in our imagination, to zombies. They're not these kind of really interesting, really attractive um, figures that, that we know today and that we know from Carmilla. But what's interesting is that German literature um, around that time tends to filter these accounts of vampirism um, and and turn them into figures that are closer to, to what we know today. For example, um, Heinrich uh, August Ossenfelder's Der Vampir, published in 1748, features the voice of, of a vampire, which in English language literature we don't get till a lot later, addressing uh, his uh, love, my dear young maiden, um, so there's this really interesting filtering of those quite vicious zombie-like figures of Flukinger's report through to this kind of romanticized uh, imagination in German literature that then gets translated into English and often published in the Dublin University magazine. Another one of these uh, tales is called Wake Not the Dead, uh, which was published in 1823 in Minerva magazine, and it was initially trans instantly translated into English. People lapped it up, they were fascinated by it. Um, I, to anybody who's interested in, in the history of, of literary vampires, I would definitely recommend it. Basically a guy tries to resurrect his dead wife and she comes back as a vampire and things go really badly. But so these are the texts that uh, the family would have been reading and would have been achieved. So basically as I'm moving in towards a conclusion, I hope that what this talk has shown is that Carmilla is not of a vampire who drinks the blood of her victims and that's it, but rather that it is a really interesting and complex web of Irish folk and fairy lore woven in with European mythology and held together through an aesthetics which is derived from the German tradition of dark romanticism and which Lefani would have encountered uh, early on in his career as a writer and as an editor of the Dublin University magazine and I will stop here and maybe I can start my video yeah. again and I'll stop sharing my screen okay yeah thank you so much Madeline that was fantastic um so interesting and there's so much that I noted down that I need to follow up on more research um the yeah the just the the roots of Irish folklore in in uh in Carmilla and beyond and then of course yeah kind of tying back into this this kind of like circular um you know uh influence of the the German folklore as well uh, yeah. romantic writers um so if anybody has any questions or comments, please do write them into the chat there and you'd be very welcome. Um, I also haven't uh, found or I haven't yet seen any of the, the other um, versions of Carmilla that you mentioned. So I'm going to try and seek them out as well. Um, yeah. I think the YouTube web series engages really interestingly with uh, with the original text. Okay, what's that? What's the name of that? It's just if you just Google YouTube Carmilla series. Okay. Easy, great. It's quite funny, yeah. And it's reimagined. It, it might seem quite silly initially because they're imagined as American college students. Uh, but actually, it's one of the most kind of faithful um, adaptations if you really kind of dig apart that appearance of, of silliness, I guess. Okay. Yeah, we can we can suspend uh, disbelief or judgment and just sort of take it for what it is. Um, so, right, we have a comment and a question from Julia. Uh, fantastic talk, Madeline. 
Could you talk a bit more about Laura's hybridity and how Laura is descended from Carmilla? Yeah, so it's suggested that on Laura's maternal side, she is descended potentially from the Kahnsteins um, and Carmilla is descended definitely from the Kahnsteins. So it's implied that potentially Carmilla might be Laura's ancestor. Um, so there is that. What Patrick O'Malley talks about the destabilization between the foreign and the domestic in that, but then also between just personal identity as the two kind of collapse into each other. And there's this kind of monstrosity of, of potentially drinking one's own blood because he refers to it as Karnstein blood. Um, and beyond that, there's just this, as I mentioned in the talk, Laura is half Austrian, half English. So it's almost like Anglo-Austrian as, as a sublimation of Lafani's own Anglo-Irish identity. Um, and she's someone who's never been to England, as is mentioned at the beginning of the tale. So she's English, but never really been to England. So there's this really weird and strange claim that she has onto the land, which is both hers and both not hers, and that she's descended from a colonial power. And it's to me, to my mind, it's clear that Lafani's working through the hybridity of, of his own identity because he saw himself as Irish. He was interested in Irish locality and Irish folklore. Um, he grew up in Ireland, but he had this awareness, especially in, in the aftermath of that kind of violence that he suffered in County Limerick as, as a child, that he wasn't really from there. And there's an added complication to that um, because Lefany was also of Huguenot descent. Um, so it, in a way, it makes me think of the way Lefani thinks about monstrosity in Carmilla as akin to Jeffrey Jerome's, Jeffrey Jerome Cohn's a monster thesis number, I can't remember which number, he's got seven monster thesis. And he mentions that the monster lies at the gate of difference, so not inside the concept of difference, but right at the gate of difference, so within that kind of hybridity. And I think that's exactly how Lefanu tries to explore monstrosity and uses hybridity to explore monstrosity um, in Laura herself too, not just in Carmilla. So, um, so the, the sort of victim or the vulnerable party is lying at the gates. Is that in that kind of hybrid, like so, this sort of like, yeah, the other, so earlier just, um, I guess when when all of these talks are online, we can compare <laughs> compare them. Yeah. But earlier um, we were talking about the vampire as the other and this sort of um, being quite appealing in, in a lot of ways. Um, and so now this is sort of like another another angle where the, the vulnerable party is the other. No, so it's, well, it's, I think this is particularly what Irish Gothic does, that it really destabilizes these boundaries. Um, there are two types of, and if you look at monster theory and how we think about monsters, there are two main ways of looking at that. And one is the monster is something that's as different from us as it could possibly be. And that's why we've got stuff like tentacular horror, you know, because we've got octopuses and stuff that are so different and so they don't have any bones and they're just so different from the human. And then you've got the monster who is almost human, but not quite human. And that's something that Jeffrey Jerome Cohn talks about. And that's, I think, the space that some vampires inhabit, certainly Carmilla. And I think she draws Laura into that because as you say, Laura, yeah, she's a victim, but she's also a colonial power there. So what, what's she doing there? Why is she there? Um, today during the, the conference, um, a brilliant scholar called Mary Burke ended a talk on Carmilla by asking, does Carmilla really need to be invited in considering that that's her, her home, that's where she lives? And I found that really, really interesting. And I think um, this sense of displaced monstrosity speaks to that very much. So if there's any further questions, don't be afraid.
Now, uh, Rachel asks, would you have any recommendations for further readings on monster theory? Um, yeah, absolutely. So um, Jeffrey Jerome Cohn's um, monster thesis is published as part of the monster culture reader. So I would definitely recommend um, all of all of that. It's it's a brilliant introduction and one of the first um, one of the first engagements uh, with it, really. Um, I would also recommend uh, Barbara Creed's uh, book on on the monstrous feminine, which is which is really good. Um, about and in terms of just Irish monsters in particular, um, Jack Fennell's book *Rough Beasts: Monsters in Irish Fiction* is is really interesting. Um, Noel Carroll, uh, Stephen T. Asma, Robin Wood all contribute to, to the monster theory. So I, what I can do is I can definitely um, kind of whip up a little document with all these and um, send them along to, to Candace if that would be useful for, for people. That would be great. And then I'm happy to send them on to everyone who registered for the talk. Yeah, no problem. Let me just pop that on my to-do list because <laughs> then. I'm sorry that I didn't have to do this. No, that's fine. It's just it it might be easier to just have all the kind of bibliographical references on monster theory uh, ready rather than just me telling you about them and then. <laughs> um. Okay. Any further questions? Uh. I would say maybe we're, maybe that's it then. Um, it was really wonderful talk, Madeline. Thank you so much. And, uh, you know, I think as the sort of aim of deepening our understanding for German-Irish vampire relations, it's absolutely um, done its job. It was so brilliant. Um, loads of food for thought and, you know, really great, really enriching. Um, so for those of you in the chat, thank everyone. There's lots of applause and lots of thanks in the chat. Um, so uh, you're all very welcome to um, partake in other events at the German Irish Vampire Festival. A lot of them are sold out, um, but I think we will be releasing a couple more tickets for some films. And of course, the um, exhibition that's happening up in Silent Green is ongoing until Tuesday at six o'clock. Um, thank you so much again, Madeline, for joining us and for everyone um, in the chat uh, as well. And thank you to those joining us from, from the internet. <laughs> and thank you again, Candice, for the invitation. And may I just add that if anybody has any thoughts or questions that they wish they could have asked, feel free to contact me um, on Twitter or via email and I'll happily um, chat to you. So, yeah, thank you again. Brilliant. Take care. Have a good evening. Likewise. Thank you.